I wrote a paper that nobody has published so far. I called it the second miracle of Philadelphia. The first miracle was the writing of the Constitution in 1789. And the second was in 1945 with the development of the ENIAC. And I made the conclusion that in the light of history, it's impossible now to tell which will have the greater influence on the ultimate history of mankind. A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. I first met John at Ursinus College. I was a sophomore, having a year of engineering before that. He was in the physics lab. My major was now history, political science, and I had ideas of becoming an Episcopalian priest. And uh, very shortly after that, I met John Markley. And when he learned that was my goal, he persisted in asking me why I wanted to do this. I don't think really wanting me to answer him, but to answer myself. I never did give an answer, but his persistent questioning was what eventually told, uh, told me I should not go that direction. And so I turned ahead and went on with my pop, uh, political science and history major, but uh, stayed any extra hours I had in the physics lab in the basement of uh, the science building there at Ursinus, working with him on ideas of how to do things electronically in the computing well. field. I have a sort of a stubborn streak in me, maybe. Uh, some people call it champion of the underdog. That uh, if other people say this can't be so, there's a sort of a challenge to say, why can't it be so? Now, let's see, let's examine that further. It turned out that all of my colleagues, my father's colleagues really, but with whom I was meeting and working then, after my father died in 28, uh, why, here I was in the 1930s uh, working for a while at this terrestrial magnetism, or TerraMag as some people call it. And when I saw that the atmospheric electricity variations that I was uh, examining seemed to vary with something on the sun, why I was told there was no good working on that. That would lead nowhere because, of course, the atmospheric electricity was purely something which was affected all the time by the wind and the dust and all sorts of meteorology and had nothing to do with the sun. One of the ideas that came to him was numbers, statistics, and so forth. And so one of his first projects was working on a theory he had of weather prediction that if he had enough records of weather performances around the world and he could analyze them statistically, he might find a way of predicting weather more accurately than we were then doing it. Now, while John uh, was teaching at Ursinus College, during the summer months he would, would always take a job in Washington, D.C., usually with the Bureau of Standards. But while he was there, he had access to a lot of the information that was available in government circles. And one was that there was a tremendous amount of weather data available everywhere. So John got the idea that he would like to statistically analyze this weather data. And so he took a lot of the uh, weather data information or copies of it back to Ursinus College. And while he was there, he employed some students who were uh, would work for 50 cents an hour doing any kind of jobs that were assigned to them. And so part of this, uh, he assigned them the job of trying to uh, take down this weather data and maybe he would do a statistical analysis of it and see just 
where what the ra rainfall was throughout all the different states and in the different uh, times of the year and so on. And he started working on this and he ran into a problem and that was that the students who were copying the data didn't always copy what they saw and when they, if they used an adding machine they didn't always copy down the exact answers which they got. They sometimes reversed the numbers and so on. So he thought, gee, there must be some way in which we can develop some kind of a, a computing machine. Well, he didn't call it a computing machine, but any kind of a machine that where there would not be so much operator intervention. And at the same time, there were some of his student uh, friends who had been uh, students with him at Ursinus College who had gone into nuclear physics. And they were in the process of counting cosmic rays, which occur about one million per second. How are they doing this? They were doing this by little electronic counters which they made themselves using electronic tubes. So John went to several of their laboratories and observed this going on and his feeling was, hey, if you can count cosmic rays, you can, you can count anything. It doesn't make any difference what it is that you put into the machine. So then he thought, well, I'm going to start seeing if I can make some counters. So he bought himself some tubes and things and tried to build an electronic computer himself up there at Ursinus College with the idea that he would analyze all this weather data. That was where he started. Well, gee, if you can count and distinguish pulses which are occurring at uh, rates which sometimes vary, of course, but are uh, as close together sometimes as a millionth of a second and maybe very slow sometimes but uh, you can somehow keep track of these things. It seemed obvious to me that uh, those same abilities of vacuum tube circuits could be used for the just the mere act of computation. Generate your own pulses your own way not have them necessarily become uh, the result of some measurement of nature's cosmic rays or nature's uh, nuclear experiments. Just generate your pulses on purpose to represent numbers and then you get these counting circuits or scaling circuits as they call them to operate with these numbers and multiply, divide as well as add and subtract. Why not? Well, nobody had any answer to that. Why not? One of the characteristics of such a neon tube is, is uh, well, the interesting character is the, is the way the voltage changes. When it fires, the voltage drops. That is when it's turned on. And uh, so it's sort of like a negative resistance. And this allows you to make a circuit so that if one is on, the other is driven off. And so it has two stable states, either this one on and this, uh, this one on and this one off or vice versa. And uh, that, that is the, that's the, the most basic part of any digital circuit. These little bulbs were, were hooked onto every flip-flop in the memory and also flip-flops that were used in any of the control circuitry or programming circuitry. So there were, I, I don't know, some uh, each accumulator had over 100 bulbs in it. Since there were 20 of them, that's over 2,000 bulbs. And then there were other bulbs on the programming circuits and other things. So there were probably over 3,000 of these little bulbs around there. Each one of these bulbs was tested first to make sure it fired on the right bullet and went out on the right bullet to make sure it was reliable. These bulbs have kind of led to a funny thing about computers, that every computer I've seen in a science fiction movie since then, since this machine came out, have had flashing lights. Our modern machines do not have flashing lights anymore. They have cathode ray tubes and so on. But most of the machines in science movies still have flashing lights, which is a throwback to this machine some years ago. Well, you know, in the summer of 1941, John Mockley went down to the Moore School of Electrical Engineering at Penn to take a summer course in electronics. He felt that he could use some uh, further knowledge of electronics. Well, when he got there, it turned out that uh, the uh, instructor of the lab where they actually had to build sing was a young uh, student, actually. He was working for his master's degree, a young fellow by the name of J. Presper Eckert who was, even at that time, regarded as the electronic genius of the school. He already had several patents under his belt and uh, was really a, a very bright, intense young man. Uh, he was the instructor of the lab course and John Mockley was the student. But when John Mockley uh, started t t 
go to this lab, he found out that a lot of the things they had to do were the same things that John had actually been teaching his students at Ursinus College. So the t he then and had, Eckert had a lot of time to talk, and they would sit, and as John Mockley once said, what do we talk about? I talked about computers. <laughs> and uh, so as long as Eckert didn't uh, have to spend all his time seeing that the other people got their questions answered, many of them went ahead all right, but he and I were free to talk. And so we would sit around on the lab table, dangling our legs and uh, spending the hours talking about whatever we were interested in talking about. Well, what were we interested in? It's funny, I can't remember what Eckert was interested in, but I know that I found out that he had a patent already. That was very impressive. He had a patent in television, a method of scanning television tubes by uh, diffraction of sound waves, by uh, using a sound wave through a tube which the light would pass through and then be bent to different parts of the television screen. The other things that uh, I more clearly remember, of course, about what we talked about in those days was uh, the subject which uh, was really my uh, all-encompassing uh, subject that I uh, wanted to know what could be done about building computers with electronic vacuum tubes as the main elements and to get some... Well, right after the course was over that Mockley was taking at the Moore School, Moore School offered him a job as an instructor or assistant professor to teach electrical engineering and other basic subjects there. So now Moore, Mockley was in the Moore School itself and he had lots of opportunity to talk to Eckert and Eckert was now pretty much interested in what John was having to say and and uh, since he was so knowledgeable of what electronic tubes could do he kept assuring John that yes if you were careful enough how you did this you'd be able to probably build a computer but just think of how many tubes it would actually have to take and no, jo no uh, job had yet been done that had a, that number of tubes all working together so they kept on discussing this sort of thing I suppose that was the first year that Mockley was there. But at the end of his, the first year he was there, a big change took place in Moore School. The Army, the uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and uh, particularly the Ballistics Research Laboratory at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, took over the differential analyzer. Now the differential analyzer was a machine that was in the Moore School, in the basement. It was the largest machine in the world. It was one of five of these wholly, purely mechanical machines. They had electric motors to run them, but otherwise they were just gears and shafts that did uh, uh, arithmetic. So uh, uh, the Army had pre previously made an agreement with the Moore School that if war did come, they would be able to take over this differential analyzer. And what they were going to use it for was to solve the problem of trajectories, the path that a bullet takes from the time it leaves the muzzle of a gun till it reaches the ground. Exterior ballistics, they call this. So the Army moved in with a nucleus of people from Aberdeen Proving Grounds and took over the differential analyzer. Well, I just graduated from college in June of 1942 with a degree in mathematics. And a notice went out asking if there were any women with a degree in mathematics to apply. And I did and was hired there at the University of Pennsylvania to work on this differential analyzer, which I did the whole during the war. Well, it turned out when Mockley saw what the Army was using the differential analyzer for, he thought, oh my goodness, that's the kind of thing that they could use from my computer if I could ever get it built. Now, it took this differential analyzer about three quarters of an hour to just solve the problem of one trajectory, and the Army needed thousands and thousands, so Mockley could easily see that there was enough if they could just get an electronic computer to keep that machine busy for the duration of the war. I found that when I was talking about these uh, advantages that I saw for a computer, uh, with electronic type, why well, I, I had lots of uh, uh, objections as to, well, it wouldn't work this way, it wouldn't be, and it, 
just in general, uh, negative thoughts about this, and you can't get anywhere that way. <laughs> the, the people who were being so negative uh, didn't uh, help me a bit, because uh, I thought that uh, what I learned from Eckert's comments and what I knew about computation, which was considerable, that practically everything they said had an answer but it wasn't necessarily an answer that the other people believed in. So how do you get this confidence or how do you get over the hump? Well, what happened was the war got worse. That's what happened. They appointed Captain Herman Goldstein, he was then Lieutenant Goldstein, to be the interrelation between Aberdeen and the Moore School, and I was the Moore School's representative on the analyzer. Uh, Goldstein was a PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago, a brilliant guy and he's still alive and still brilliant. Anyway, he stood on the floor of the steps going down into the analyzer room with me and he said, you know, Joe, when we got this machine back in 38 or whatever it was, they got it. We thought, what are we gonna do with all those trajectories? But he said, it's so slow now, so slow, we need so many. And I said, why don't you talk to my friend Mockley upstairs? Oh, who's this? I said, well, he's got ideas how to do it electronically. Can I meet him? I said, sure, come on. So I was living at John's house at that time, a sort of a border bachelor at the time. And so I took Goldstein up and introduced them and they sat down and had quite a conflab. At the end of which Goldstein said, well, why don't you write a little report on this, which John did. And that's the famous report. He gave it to Brainerd to s transmit, since Brainerd was in charge of all research work, to transmit to Aberdeen. Uh, I think he wrote it in August. And about a month later, Aberdeen called up and says, where is your memo? And John went into Brainerd and said, did you send the memo to Aberdeen? What memo? Well, the memo I gave you, I don't remember any memo. So now we come back to the same secretary that I mentioned earlier. She had taken down his report in shorthand some three months earlier or something, and she went and got her notes and recopied them. This is a very good feat for a stenographer, you know, three months later. She had good enough notes there. She reconstructed the whole report a second time. This time it got down there. Now we find John in this Matthew principle again. Uh, the Moore School says, electronically, well, we already had Irvin Travis look into this. And he says, you can't do it electronically. It's got to be done mechanically. That's the only way to go. And here's John yelling, electronics. So that was already a, a bad no omen. Then the, the Moore School took an unusual turn. They said, well, we don't want to get into this. We're not a development house, we're a teaching institution. You're making us into a, a laboratory sort of thing. So they were opposed to it. Again, John has the roadblock. One day, Goldstein and Brainerd, I think, Eckert and Mockley went to Aberdeen and presented a formal proposal for the ENIAC. It was to be a replacement for the analyzer, so it was sometimes called an electronic differential analyzer. That was to make the thing palatable to the powers that be in the uh, Aberdeen forces, Army Ordnance. Goldstein uh, got his car, put Eckert and me in the back seat, and uh, drove out to Paoli where he picked up Brainerd, who had just had his breakfast. And uh, I don't remember whether we had much breakfast, uh, but the uh, point was to drive down to Aberdeen and get that report uh, under consideration because it was going to be a meeting. When we got down there, we would spent all the time on the ride down in the back seat of the car trying to pencil out further notes as to how we were going to complete this report. And then, when we arrived at the Ballistic Research Laboratory, why uh, Goldstein saw to it that we were uh, put in a room uh, with a secretary nearby so that we could uh, try to finish as much as we could, and the secretary would type these things. And then sometime in the afternoon, why, we were invited to come in to an office or room where Colonel Simon was and uh, meet with him for a short while until we left. We were told that uh, it had been decided to go ahead.
Well, a couple years later, in 1944, one day, uh, Mockley and Eckert came down to the analyzer room one evening, and they said, would you girls like to come up and see what we've just done? I think this was the week that they had finally gotten two accumulators to work. We went upstairs, and there they had these two accumulators, the first, you might say, building blocks of the ENIAC were now completed and ready for operation, and this was about April of 44. And they said, watch this. And they pressed, or John, I don't remember which one, put the number five in. And they said, they pushed this little button, they had a little handheld, uh, a, a wire coming from the machine with a little button on the end of it, and flip the five seemed to go over to the other accumulator but moved over three places so you got 5,000 and they said there you've multiplied by five by a thousand and we said what? <laughs> the other girl with me was a girl by the name of Alice Snyder um, and uh, we were both amazed because it required all this equipment <laughs> to multiply <laughs> Five by a thousand. One night when I was a sophomore at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, I was walk I walked a girl back home to West Philadelphia to had a date and it was I think a Friday night and I was walking back to my residence and I passed the Moore School and the whole building was dark except one room had a light on it. I was just convinced it had to be John, so I went up and rang the bell uh, at the Moore School. And sure enough, John opened the door. He said, boy, am I glad to see you. And I said, oh, I'm glad to see you, John, too. It's been oh, a couple years. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, I got something to show you. He said, it's top secret, but there's nobody here but us. So he got a big bunch of keys out of his pockets and he unlocked the door and turned the lights on and it was a long lab room long long and fairly narrow and uh, he said there it is I looked around you know I just saw normal things you'd think you'd see in a lab and I said there what is John he said the calculator the calculator and I said where he said there and he took me over to the front wall of the building and there were a whole series of radio chassis with vacuum tubes in them all interconnected and they were sitting on metal tables little metal tables and they were interconnected and ran the whole length of the front wall and then they went around to the side wall and around to the back wall and a he said, that's the calculator. Well, uh, finally, around in February of 1946, or maybe a little bit before that, the Army decided that they wanted to publicize this great machine since obviously it was working. So they uh, prepared, first of all, by preparing a number of problems. And then they brought in uh, Pathé News, which was the new, big news item of the uh, day in that time, to come in and take a picture of the ENIAC in operation. Well, the ENIAC was black. All the cabinets were black. And there were little red neon tubes that told exactly what the numbers were. They went from zero to nine. And there were, uh, in each uh, accumulator, there were uh, 10 of these rows from zero to nine. And they had these little black neon, uh, uh, little red neon tubes. But when you showed them in black and white, they came out black, so you really couldn't see what the machine was doing. So the very the night before or so, I think Mockley and Eckert were both there, and uh, the, the people were there from Path A News trying to make this film, and they didn't know what in the world they could do, so the numbers would show up as, they were oper as the machine was operating. And uh, somebody came up with the idea that they could replace each of these little uh, red neon bulbs with an actual bulb. So they went out and they bought thousands of these little bulbs and painted the numbers from zero to nine on them and screwed them in where the little electronic, little red neon tubes had been. So that whenever you see a picture of the original ENIAC, you will see the numbers going up on, 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 on round balls that look like ping pong balls, but actually they were uh, just a substitute for the 
the red neon bulbs that were there in the first place. So one program step, let me clear this away, uh, one program step was, is essentially each one of these boxes. So each one of these sets of knobs uh, really corresponds to one, what you might think of as one instruction in a modern computer. Uh, and what it could do on a single um, pulse is send out the number that it had on any one of, alpha, on any one of five lines, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. So it could send a pulse out, sorry, on alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. This guy is actually to put two of these things together. So if you wanted a longer uh, uh, number than 10 digits, you could just put two of them together, giving you what we now call double precision. Um, uh, the other thing that it could do is it could either send out um, the current number that it stored out to uh, essentially other machines, or it could send out uh, essentially that number negated uh, what we call basis, basically nines complement to another machine. Um, or it could sit there and do nothing on a cycle. It turns out doing nothing turned out to be very useful because sometimes there were timing problems and while it would do nothing, it would do nothing at the right time, which was useful for later. Um, so the idea is that you might have one machine transmitting a number and several other machines adding that number at the same time. So you could, you could actually form multiple results simultaneously. So this is actually a very big parallel adding machine. From some aspects it looked like a very cumbersome machine, but it was a very flexible machine. And among other things, it was a very parallel machine. Now I've seen claims that other machines were the first parallel machine to be built. Uh, several such claims for different machines. But I don't know that anything was more parallel than the ENIAC, which was the first machine. Right after the demonstration of the ENIAC, Moore School was suddenly famous. Here, publicity was coming in from all over the world uh, about this famous thing. Also, questions were coming in, can we have a, an ENIAC? Everybody wanted to buy an ENIAC, and uh, professors of mathematics all over the world were wondering when they could come and actually maybe put a problem on. Well, at the same time, at the Moore School, uh, Professor Erwin Travis had returned. He was the one whose position John had taken when he had first been hired way back in 1941, and he had gone into the Navy as a naval officer in charge of contracts. So he came back as soon as, I think, just about the time that ENIAC was announced, and he was just quite delighted with his new position in Moore School because he resumed his position as head of all contracts. And he was delighted, and he, right away, do we have the patents on that thing? So, of course, uh, Moore School then explained to them that they had made an agreement with Eckert and Mockley where any uh, um, institution or government institution could build an ENIAC or a copy of it. They had the, what they called the Iliomocenary rights, but that Eckert and Mockley had the right, the commercial rights to build this computing machine. Well, this did not make Professor Travis too happy, to say the least. And it was that all of a sudden we were told all of the computer research and all kinds of research projects the Moore School from now on are under Dr. Travis, Director of Research. The next thing we were told was, Dr. Travis wants to see you. Next thing, when we see him, he says, I don't want any more of this nonsense that we've been having about patents and uh, all that stuff, so uh, I want you to sign these agreements. He said, well, the patents are no issue. We've signed a patent agreement with the university. It's all settled. Don't worry about it. He says, no, this is all settled from now on. If you want to continue to work here at the university, you must sign these agreements. Well, the uh, substance of the agreements were that uh, Eckert and I would work for contracts, a year-to-year -year renewable thing, for a stated fee, which was a stated salary, which wasn't much, um, and that we would do no consulting outside. All our work would be the property of the Moore School, the patents be the property of the university, and so on. And uh... Immediately after the demonstration, 
the Moore School fired Eckert Mockley. Now that seemed very strange, but it all became a, about because of this patent issue. Uh, uh, Professor Travis issued an order. He said there were 10 days in which they were to give up any patent rights which they had. Now Eckert and Mockley couldn't understand this at all because as far as they were concerned, the university had all the rights it needed to go on and build a, a computer if they wanted to or to allow any other institution to build a computer if they wanted to. So Eckert and Mockley refused. Well, it wasn't just Eckert Mockley alone. As a matter of fact, all the people that worked with him on the project also had to sign this agreement to give up any rights to any patents which they might develop during a work that was being done at the University of Pennsylvania. So at, at the end of the 10 days, Eckert Mockley refused to sign this. They gave them another 10 days. And then they, Eckert Mockley still refused to sign. And then they said, OK, you're out the door. So Eckert and Mockley just left. They had no, no other job to go to or anything like that, but they just, uh, University of Pennsylvania was uncompromising at this time. Why they thought they needed the commercial rights, no one knows, because they certainly weren't going to go in the business of building computers. Yeah, I know it was, it was terrible for us. It was really a catastrophic error uh, for them, for Penn, for them to leave. And the fact that the um, electrical engineering department here, sitting on the birth of digital electronics, went back to the old ways and let it go, was a, um, a fundamental error that we're still, frankly, recovering from. Well, after Eckert and Mockley left, uh, Moore School. There they were in, the, in March of 1946 without a job or anything else and they decided that they would try to start a company where they would b do something electronic but they didn't know what in the world it would be and they didn't have any money. But uh, before they could do anything they got word from the Moore School. There was a professor, Carl Chambers, there who later became the dean of the Moore School and he thought that when Eckert and Mockley and all the other engineers left, they left all the technology with them because none of the other professors at the Moore School had been in any way involved in the ENIAC. So uh, they, uh, Professor Chambers then negotiated with the government that there would be a contract to teach everything about electronics, an electronic course, and this uh, course has since gone down in history, you might say, as, as the Moore School Lectures. And to the Moore School Lectures were invited everybody that was interested in computing machines in government installations, like the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Bureau of Standards, uh, even the Census Bureau, I think, all sent representatives, as did MIT. That's when they first get, got interested in electronic digital computing by sending people to this course. And uh, the teachers of the course were mainly Eckert and Mockley, but everybody else that was in, in interested in, in computing in those days, like uh, professors from Harvard and from MIT and from Princeton, all came over and each ta taught a separate part of this course. It was an actually, actually it was a wonderful course, and uh, this professor Douglas Hartree came here from uh, Cambridge, England, and he uh, took part in the course. He was a student. I think he also gave a lecture, but also to this uh, lecture, to these lectures came Professor Morris Wilkes, who went back to England and built the first electronic computer in England called the Ed Sack. But he had actually been trained here uh, under Eckert and Mockley. So this took up all summer. I think it was a 10 week course or something like this. And everybody who was who had been anybody in computing and who became anybody in computing actually was a part of this course. After that course was over, Eckert and Mockley still had to earn a living and they went ahead then uh, renting a building and setting up this company called Electronic Control Company. Well, as I said before, they had no money. They were pretty much operating on, their, on a shoestring and whatever salary they could bring in. So at this time, Mr. Eckert, uh, Press's father, lent them $25,000 and uh, they uh, 
furnish the building and, and start to hire some of the engineers that had worked with them on the ENIAC. As a matter of fact, a lot of the engineers came back and said they'd work for nothing as long as they could stay with Eckert and Mockley. They were sure that this was going to work. Well, Eckert and Mockley went to all the banks in, in the Philadelphia area trying to borrow some money, thinking, gee, everybody be interested in this. And they said, no, why would anybody want that? Who wants electronics in an office? They kept trying to tell the people at the banks that they would use these computers. Preston and I decided to go into business and uh, we got the indication from the, uh, more, from the um, Census Bureau that uh, they would be interested in a product which we uh, then called EDVAC 2 because everybody was talking about EDVAC but nobody had any idea uh, what a computing machine was like except to uh, resemble, something that resembled that. But after a while we decided on a name and uh, called it UNIVAC. And the Universal Automatic Computer uh, became the main product of uh, this new company which started out in life as Electronic Control Company and then switched over to be a stock company known as Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation. Well, I won't uh, worry you about the um, how we had to get financing so we would live through to see today, but uh, we did have several efforts at financing, including the American Totalizator Company, and finally we became part of the Remington Rand organization. By that time we had already secured three contracts for UNIVAC through the Bureau of Standards, uh, who were then uh, set up as the agency to procure new computers of this electronic breed uh, for the government. And we got not only a contract then for census, but for the Army Map Service and also the Air Controller's Office in the Pentagon. The, the first big contract that they got for the UNIVAC was from Census Bureau, and Eckert and Mockley devoted all their energies and time into developing that. It was a completely different machine from ENIAC, no question about it. First of all, ENIAC had t almost 20,000 tubes, 18,000 tubes, whereas UNIVAC had about 2,000 tubes. There were no switches to be set on, any, on the UNIVAC. On ENIAC, you had to go around setting switches for every operation that you wanted to do, but all the information came into the UNIVAC on magnetic tape. Now, magnetic tape had been developed, actually. It was a phosphor bronze tape that Eckert and Mockley had developed themselves. The information was no longer decimal. For the UNIVAC, it was binary, binary information. So Eckert and Mockley started out building this machine, and they built the very first one for the Census Bureau. There it was, the very first commercial computer in the world, the UNIVAC one. The UNIVAC, which is the original name of the, uh, the commercial version, of the ENIAC. It's the commercial version. The ENIAC, I did, that was done at the Eckert Markley Computer Corporation, but I, I got there just as they moved. So they started with Remington Rand. Remington, the Eckert Markley merged with Remington Rand and it was owned by them and then became Sperry Rand or something later. But during that transition period is when they were planning to sell a UNIVAC, which they only had artist sketches. It's like Raymond Lowy designing the Studebaker and then handing it to the people at Studebaker and saying, for Christ's sake, get it built. I promised them that we're going to be driving these things. I don't care whether you know how to stamp out a round grill or not. Get it done. So these people, the, the computer part wasn't the tough part. It was things like the control panel, right. the tape units. Nobody had any tape units that worked, so we had to build our own. We, it would be much more fun if we could have gone out and bought a, a six gigabyte hard drive and thrown all this information into it and taken it out later to print. Then you could really have some high speed computers because a modern disk drive here could take stuff faster than that computer could compute. We, in, in the UNIVAC, what good does it do you if you can do 23,000 operations a second and you can't send it anyplace? I mean, you can't. 
You can't put it on paper because the paper won't print fast enough. And you can't put it in the storage because the core memory wasn't that fast. And you can't put it someplace else because there wasn't enough memory. <laughs> I've thought since of Mozart because he wrote a letter to his father one time and made the statement, and I had the entire work at once in my brain. And that was Don Giovanni, the three-hour opera. He knew everything about it at once in his brain, which is an amazing thing to say, but I had an experience just like it with that Binac. I came out of there saying, I know exactly how to write that book. And I sat down, I wrote it longhand. I got a piece of t a tablet with 50 sheets, yellow paper with blue lines on it, and I wrote all day long. When the tablet was empty, I threw it in the wastebasket and I went home. And I wrote that manual. It's about two inches thick when it all got typed up with illustrations. Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Cronkite speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. The big election night, 1952. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. Univac is going to try to predict the winner for us just as early as we can possibly get the return. This was CBS. One of the radio uh, channels came and said, uh, well, with your Univac now working, could you uh, do anything about prognosticating the election on the early returns? And so he said yes. And Remington Rand, who just bought us, and so it was very interested in this. And so uh, they hired a statistician from uh, Penn, who was a very good man, I might add, and he said, yes, we can take the early returns as we study them from the previous five, ten or so presidential elections and probably do a job on this one, given the first returns. So it was all set up, and the guy did his equations, and they were all put on the computer, and everything was worked out. Comes the election night, and here's a guy named Draper, D-R-A-P-E-R, -E remember, who was from Remington Rand, and I don't know, several other people, quite excited about the whole thing. In come the first returns. They put it into the UNIVAC, and up comes Eisenhower by 400 and some electoral votes, Stevens and so-and-so. Well, the general feeling was that Stevens had a much better chance than that, if not even might win. And so they knew the UNIVAC was wrong. And so they got the statistician to adjust his figures. They didn't even announce that one over the radio. They held it up. And uh, after he had jimmied things around a bit, it came out with a little better count for Stevenson and so that's what they broadcasted and this went on through the rest of the evening it was clearly a landslide for Eisenhower and they ultimately came to conclude that when it was all over the computer on those first runs had come very close to exactly what the final run was vindicating the statistician's fine work but it was the timidity of the Remington Rand people they wouldn't broadcast that this were the results so you can't win as more votes came in the odds came back, and it was obviously evident that we should have had nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place. It was right. We were wrong. Next year, we'll believe it. It seems that before he was prevented from handling classified material, he had received a letter talking about some classified project and whether or not the company wanted to do it. And the letter said clearly this is to be read and destroyed. So John read the letter. And at that time we were in this new building, a new building, it's an old building, but new house at 1215 Walnut Street. It's an old house right on the main street of Walnut Street. <coughs> and it had four floors to it. Uh, the walnut banister and all kinds of walnut woodworking up on the second, third, fourth floor. Uh, the first floor had been taken over and became a Roger Kent clothing store. So that was the end of that part of the house, but there was the great staircase up the side. And when you got to the second floor, the landing, there were rooms back there, and there was more staircase going up here, and here was a, what was now a bathroom, and the front were, was room for several offices, one of which was John's. He was the president of the corporation. So we were all working away busily one morning when suddenly John emerges from the bathroom hollering, get me a fire extinguisher, quick. And of course, 
being stupid like we were, we said, what for? Instead of getting the, well, somebody got the fire extinguisher, but some of us stayed by to say, what for? He said, well, the toilet seat's on fire, <laughs> which only baffled us further. But he got the extinguisher, went in and got the fire out and then came out. And <laughs> all of us want to know why was the fire, the, bath, uh, the toilet seat on fire? Well, it seems he'd taken this confidential paper, thinking he'd destroy it. He'd put it in the john, light it with a match, and thus burn it and destroy it, not realizing that the toilet seat was a highly inflammable acetate of some sort, and so as soon as the flame came up, the toilet seat set on fire. So we may renamed him Hot Ass Mockley after that. <laughs> um, just one of the things that went through his life. We, we invented some pretty good stuff. When I say we, I didn't have any of the invention. I did have an invention there, but it was not tied to the business, so that's a separate thing. But the uh, we had the fastest tape drives that had ever been made at, up to that time. We had the fastest printer. Uh, probably had the best computer. I don't, I don't know because I didn't have anything to compare it with any place else. During the lunch hours and during the breaks, people were fencing in the hallways and having chess matches in the meeting rooms and big important stuff. It was always fascinating to watch all these crazy people working. Fencing in the hallway? Fencing, yeah. This, Chan Chu was, a, was fencing with someone. I can't remember who because I didn't know all their names. But John Sims was there at the time. A lot of the, all, uh, the original engineers who worked on a lot of this stuff, they were all there. And uh, so you would get to watch all these things. And then at night, Dr. Markley and I would ride home in his, how much, must have been in 54, yeah. Well, it was 55, I guess. I think it was in 1955, because he had a 54 Mercury convertible, and we would go slamming up over the dipsy doodles and crashing down onto the streetcar tracks, and then rip up the Wissahickon Drive, and always stopped at the camera shop on Wiss uh, Somewhere going up Wissahickon Drive into the bottom of Chestnut Hill, I can't remember the name of the street, he always ended up stopping at a camera shop. And there we would, much to his wife's chagrin, we would buy a hundred dollars worth of something. It was always something because the salesman always saw him coming and always said, you got it doctor, you have got to have this. This new super duper light meter with whatever it was and six gadgets and he'd buy a whole pile of stuff and take it home. And I was always going, my God. He, he had cameras and tape recorders and wire recorders and recorder recorders and anything that moved he bought. Uh, I uh, was never a student of John Mockley's. Uh, my, my brother was and uh, I talked to quite a number of the of older students that have graduated before me uh, who were students of his and they talked about him uh, doing this uh, program at Christmas time and uh, there was a little bit of difference of opinion whether he really had roller skates on or whether he had a skate board and uh, one day I was digging in one of the drawers in the lab over here and I found these roller skate wheels so uh, to me that that was it. <laughs> uh, I th apparently he had those wheels attached to, to a board. Well, I took them and uh, attached them to a board as close as I thought he probably had. And uh, of course, what he was trying to do with that was to uh, demonstrate Newton's laws with that. Uh, when uh, John was in high school, he was really a very busy sort of a guy. And not only was he editor-in-chief of his high school newspaper, but he also uh, took piano lessons, and not only that, but he had jobs on the side. In those days, everybody had a doorbell that was battery operated. And of course, when the uh, doorbell didn't work anymore, they sent for John, and he could go in there and replace the batteries. And eventually, when electricity became much more prevalent, he was able to actually wire up some electric doorbells for some of the people. Mm -hmm. 
John Mockley was a great person for reading. He was always reading, and his, and his eyes were very bad, and so he started to wear glasses fairly young, as a matter of fact. But his mother would always object to his reading after he went to bed at night. And uh, so whenever she saw the light on in his room, she would always start a fuss and make him put it out and stop reading. So he designed this little switch himself. There were three, from the first floor, there were three steps up and then there was a landing and then the steps went up in a different direction. But if you stood on the, th on the landing, you could look up and see whether there was a light under this door. So John arranged to have a little electronic switch and as soon as his mother stepped on the first switch, on the first step, it would switch out the light up in his bedroom. And then by the time she got to the landing and could look up, of course the light was out. So, and then as soon as she went back down again, the switch went on, he could resume his reading. He, his eyesight failed, uh, suffered from this, but he enjoyed his reading. My father was named Sebastian Jacob Mockley. That's quite a name considering the ones that you hear nowadays. Well, he went to Ohio State University and uh, got his bachelor's degree. And uh, I don't know much about just how he got where uh, he did next, but uh, he was a, uh, when I was born, he was a principal of a high school in Swanton, Ohio. That's a suburb of Cincinnati near where they make ivory soap. But we lived in a, a rather remote uh, end of Bradley Lane in a frame house which uh, gave us plenty of uh, advantages to uh, do what we wanted. Uh, gave me uh, the opportunity in uh, the years when I learned how to uh, wire up the house and put uh, uh, telephone connections in which the telephone company objected to and had to take out again. Um, and other kinds of sort of more or less automatic warning devices. If somebody was coming upstairs, it would turn out the lights in my room. So if they think I'd gone to bed when I really hadn't, I was reading detective stories. And uh, that sort of thing went on, as I say, at an early age. I had uh, buried uh, lines when they finally put uh, the water system in. Originally, we worked with well water. And uh, they, uh, when they installed the water system, I, I took advantage of the ditches they dug to uh, drop wires into the ditch before they filled them in and had uh, underground wires to some of my uh, neighbor's houses to do a little bit of uh, telegraph and uh, trying to do telephone. My telephones weren't very good. I didn't know how to make a carbon button microphone. Uh, John was very fond of telling long and complicated stories. And one of his fr old school friends, Gus Winnemore, often tells a story about how when their father would pick John up in the morning, he'd start on a story, and he would keep telling it all the way to school. No matter what happened, the story went on and on. We would try to stay awake, we'd try to stay awake, and finally we'd Win and I would both doze off and go to sleep. And the next morning, John would say, Now, where was I when you fell asleep? So uh, he would back up and tell us, we would tell the last thing we heard, and he said, okay, and then he would start from there and continue the story. <laughs> uh, I walked to school for a mile while I was going to the uh, local elementary school, and then when it came time to go to high school, why well, I, I walked practically that mile to get to the streetcar line to take the Chevy Chase streetcar right down into the center of Washington, where on uh, Rhode Island Avenue around 7th Street was the McKinley Technical High School, where one could uh, learn all kinds of uh, physics and other s subjects which were better taught there, we thought, than uh, at any other high school. This was the one technical high school of the city. And uh, it was a coeducational high school, too. There were lots of girls there as well as boys. It says, girls to whom I have given special attentions. And it has the name on the left and then remarks on the right. And it says, Nancy Adams. Her father taught math at Tech High School. He was a good teacher. Helen Linton. 
and said the reasons the reasons why they talk she likes them I says because I wanted to is number one two because I thought she wanted me to and then the three is both of the above and four because I wanted to see what would happen so uh, Jean Stimson she lived right on the on Raymond Street in Chevy Chase, Easterbrook, Easter, uh, Jones, Easterbrookville Road, one and four, because I wanted to, and four, because I wanted to see what would happen. And I thought that was great to have a remote control which would set off a firecracker. And uh, there were more and more things. I actually made a pipe bomb which I uh, set off uh, that way. But uh, in a remote way, so that uh, it wasn't going to da endanger me or anyone else. One of the things I remember, for instance, in those days, we uh, uh, set off firecrackers on Fourth of July. They, uh, you could buy them in Maryland; though you couldn't. They were outlawed in the District of Columbia. So we were living in Maryland, and we would buy firecrackers. <laughs> I know that John Mockley had a skateboard. I know that he made it himself out of a pair of uh, roller skates. But uh, he used it to demonstrate Newton's laws of motion. I know that. But the rumor goes around that at one time he fell off the skateboard and broke his arm. That, I'm pretty sure, never ever happened. And the second thing is that they demonstrate up there, or at least they point out, that these marks on the lab, physics lab table were left by John Mockley's roller skates. I can hardly believe that. Mockley had the most utter reverence for using the right tool for the right thing. He would never, never, ever leave a mark on a, t on a lab table. And as a matter of fact, uh, if I ever tried to use a knife instead of a screwdriver, I, <laughs> I don't think I should have lived so long. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's the board <laughs> with the roller skate wheels on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I looked for that. I think I found the uh, just uh, a couple minutes ago. I think I found the wheels, but they've been put on a different board, <laughs> so it is no longer that particular board. But the one thing you'll notice in this picture is there are tracks on the desk. Right. Did you notice that? They were, they were made by his, his demonstrations. Another famous point that was always made is he roller skated on the lab table. He was trying to represent inertia. And so he'd get on a pair of roller skates and get up on this big long stone tabletop there in the center of the assembly hall. The lecture hall is what it was. And he'd stand there and then he would move his arms in and out this way and of course get reactions on the skates as he'd move his body by inertial effects and so on. Well yeah, from what I heard, John Mockley liked to have some science fun now and then. And one of his greatest achievements was propelling himself around the classroom on a homemade skateboard using a fire extinguisher, you know, to make him move around. And uh, one time he propelled himself right off a lab table and broke his arm. I made Jimmy a dollar for the stock since yesterday on this one. I made a dollar on this one, and I made a dollar and a half, dollar and five eighths, whatever the hell that is. Dollar sixty two on the other one. Share. That ain't bad, Jimmy. I could just do that each day. I have a new 30 foot boat. He and I worked on a lot of stuff verbally. Didn't work on too many things. Um, we worked on like Teflon lining biscuit pans. We thought that was a good one. And irons and axes. We had a lot of things that we were doing we were trying to do long time before they ever came out on the markets at all. And um, 
he shared every, every crackpot inventor that ever came to the door, he would straighten out their act and send them away with all good information, which was astounding to me. What we see here is my version of a cheap instrument to do the analysis of data into waves, and in particular, sine waves and cosine waves, which are the standard kinds of waves into which mathematicians and physicists and others usually analyze their wave motion. And this has to have a lot of knobs for the entry of the data. Nowadays, that would seem rather foolish. Why uh, you just uh, punch a keyboard and put it into a computer, uh, or a little earlier than this, you punched a card, a punch card, and that somehow conveyed it to a computing device. Or in some cases, you punched holes in a paper tape, and that went to a computer. But here. Just as in an adding machine or a desk calculator, all the data is entered at the keyboard or the operating position of the computer. Here, all the data is entered through turning and setting knobs. And the readout is the numbers that I'm interested in come out on a meter here. So I went and made myself a new kind of computer, if you like. <clears throat> Most people would call this a, an information device, a transformation of information. Uh, at the Army Security Agency, where I uh, took this to show it to the experts there, why we called it a cipher machine. What this did was to take letters of a message and change them to other letters so that when you got through copying out the letters which they were changed to, <coughs> there was very little to show you what the original message was. In fact, you might work for weeks trying to figure out what the original message was. But this same box that I built here out of rudimentary materials actually, um, contained uh, the circuits also to decipher the message and tell you from the, the ciphered one uh, what the original text or the clear was. <laughs> This card I hold in my hand, for instance, is an example of something simple uh, <laughs> which I applied to uh, this purpose. These came with vitamin capsules of the time, back in the 1930s. And a little gelatin pellet was in each one of those holes as it was delivered to my family doctor as a sample. But the uh, pieces of cardboard punched through those holes looked to me like such a beautiful thing and terrible to waste it. And so it would fit very nicely on top of these uh, little neon bulbs, providing I spaced the bulbs properly to fit the holes, which I did. This stuff is um, wallboard, uh, pressed board. I think it was made out of sugar cane originally. But uh, I bought it as building supplies, of course. And uh, that was easier for me to work with than uh, panels of wood. And uh, I mounted my sockets and uh, did all the things I had to do with all kinds of surplus things that I'd uh, bought in these markets where they took apart and bought up old uh, radios and. Uh, got parts which the radio manufacturer decided he didn't need to use anymore because he discontinued that model and so on. And profited by the switches, the condensers, the sockets, everything practically was on the cheap side. Uh, uh, John Mockley was married the first time in uh, 1930 
and uh, while he was working for his doctor's degree, his wife was a gal by the name of Mary Walzel. Now she died in, right after the ENIAC was announced in 1946. Uh, evidently they had gone on a vacation to Wildwood, New Jersey, and while they were in swimming she drowned accidentally. Mary was like a big sister to me. I knew her very well. I lived out there at the farm for four or five months and taught me how to drink scotch and how to enjoy Beethoven both. Uh, it was a great person. She was a renegade too, and the same as John was. She was born in a Roman Catholic family and announced at six she'd have nothing to do with it and didn't. And was very vehement, vehement about it. And uh, so they, uh, they had a good marriage in a way, but uh, it was too short-lived. He was working at these hours of 8 to 4, teaching in 4 to 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning on the ENIAC. John, you have to stop this. You have to break. You have to do something. And so that one afternoon in August, Friday afternoon, she finally persuaded him, let's go down to the shore. I think it was Cape May they went to, Wildwood. And uh, they decided to go skinny dipping after dark or when it was just almost dark. And uh, John was quite nearsighted. And to swim, he had to take off his glasses. So he did and parked them on the shore with his clothes. And the two of them went in and very shortly afterwards. Mary was calling for some help and he couldn't see her. And uh, this is the story I know. And uh, she drowned. When I came to uh, the Moore School in 1942, I was hired as a civil service employee as a computer, which were was a grade below being a mathematician, which men could be, but women were hired as computers, no matter what degrees they had. So uh, I worked on the differential analyzer all during the war, and just about the time the war ended, at least the war in Germany had ended, uh, ENIAC was near completion. And at that time, they decided that they needed to train some women to learn how to operate the ENIAC for when it was finally finished. So I was one of those chosen, and another uh, computer chosen at the same time was a gal by the name of Betty Bardick, who had just come in from Missouri with her degree in mathematics, and she and I uh, were one of the five chosen to go to Aberdeen to learn all about ENIAC. Uh, Betty Holberton and I were sitting in the second floor classroom, and we were sitting there trying to figure out how an accumulator worked. And so we were sitting there puzzling, and this man came in, and looked all around, he walked around the room and looked around the ceiling. And he said, I'm just checking to see if the ceiling's falling in because they had jackhammers. They were putting a third floor on and they had jackhammers up there and all kinds of noises. So we, I'd never seen him before. <laughs> so it turned out it was John Mockley. He introduced himself. Fall so of 1946, the ENIAC was moved physically to Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and we five girls who had worked on it were supposed to go down. Some of them uh, did not go down, but I went to Aberdeen and worked on the ENIAC. But it had to be completely reinstalled and checked out, which took almost a year. So I was working down there all the time. I lived, lived down there in a, in a women's dormitory. And uh, at that same time, of course, Mockley had about this time gotten a contract with the Bureau of Census to build a UNIVAC, but they had to operate through the Bureau of Standards. And John uh, was the principal, you might say, seller of the machine and its, its physical properties. So he had to go down and, with, and meet with the people from the Bureau of Standards on a pretty regular basis. Now, in those days, the main route from Philadelphia, Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. was Route 40, which went right through Aberdeen. So John got in the habit of sometimes checking in at Aberdeen to see how the ENIAC was coming along. After all, that was his baby. <laughs> and uh, so after a while, it seemed like he was more interested in who was operating the machine than what was the machine was doing. Yes. Well, when I first married John, uh, and that was, he said, a great emergency. His, <laughs> his mother was sick. His, his wife had previously died two years before that, and uh, his mother was not well. His children didn't have anybody much looking after them. And uh, the housekeeper that uh, he had hired to look after the children was about to have a baby, and she was going to leave. And, oh, he had so many compelling reasons why we should get married. 
And uh, so, uh, anyway, we did. You had none, of course. <laughs> well, I don't know. I felt that um, there were so many women then that were looking for a husband uh, just to have somebody look after them, and I felt that uh, here was a man I really loved. I may as well <laughs> marry him. That was a good reason. He was in addition to skating on the tabletop in the auditorium. Uh, mirror writing was another thing he could do that looked as good as whether you, when you wrote in a normal fashion. But all kinds of things we thought about that would be possible effects of this computer. And of course, much, la much later we realized one of the things that never entered our mind, and we did not mention at those press conferences, was the possibility of space flight. Werner von Braun, who just recently died, was credited with the statement that uh, we couldn't have gotten to the moon, we couldn't have made a lot of these space flights without the characteristics of the computer to, in real time, control what was going on out there with that vehicle and control the jets and so on so that uh, everything worked the way it was wanted. But at that time, I'd heard of Goddard, I'd heard of rockets, I've heard of a lot of things, but the whole space age somehow did not <laughs> unfold in my imagination then as something which was going to be keyed to the use of computers, which it obviously was. Our job as Americans and as Republicans is to dislodge the traitors from every place where they've been sent to do their traitorous work. When the Eckert Markley group, or well, Eckert Markley joined together to make the electronic control company, the first company, they needed a secretary, and John knew about this girl, so he hired her. At that time, which was McCarthy committee days, there was the word pinko running around. It meant you weren't communist, but you were a little too close to those who were. And I think this girl had some such connection. She was not herself communist. I know her well enough. This was not her taste at all, but she had friends who were. And in due course, John had to apply for permission to handle classified material. And so we had what they call the FBI investigation. And that uncovered this particular contact and so he was hauled before the McCarthy Committee, and there the question was asked, would you knowingly hire an engineer who was a communist? And John's answer was, it all depends on whether he's a good engineer or not. And that did it. He was put on the blacklist for at least 10 or 15 years. And it was a very great harm to his company because they tried to get certain classified information and it all had to be done with John excluded from it. He could have nothing to do with it. Everything was coming up roses. They had contracts for about 10 different univacs with the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and with the Census Bureau. Everything was roses. And all of a sudden, here comes a new problem, a clearance problem. It, uh, the uh, Army, the Air Force, the Navy all rescinded their contracts. They said they could not do any business with a company that had a clearance problem. Now, named as possible communists were John Mockley, the president of the company, and three or four of the engineers, and Mockley's secretary. Now, this, all of this was sort of wild altogether, and uh, why in the world had this happened? Well, Eckert Mockley immediately uh, started a fight for his clearance, and the engineers who were named had uh, uh, had all been hired by Eckert, or else had worked at the Moore School with them. So they were old friends, and there was no politics was not something that entered into any of their business as far as they could see. But uh, John Mockley had to resign his position as president of the company. He was, he was not, the company was denied clearance unless Mockley was totally off the premises. So John had to work for some, some had to go work someplace else for two years while he tried to get his name cleared. And the other, the other engineers, some of them, just left. 
And uh, the secretary also left, although none of them were ever de declared communists or anything like that. And Mockley it took him about two years to finally get his name cleared and he was able to go back in. Now they know for a fact that there were spies planted in the company. Why? They don't know. But this is the way it was. And it really destroyed the company because the main contracts that they had going at that time were lost to them. was that in giving my paper on uh, the application of statistics to uh, the problem of does the sun affect our weather, which I gave to the American Physical Society rather than the meteorologists, who I'm sure would not think of it very uh, uh, well, they would take, we wouldn't take it seriously, we'll say. Um, at the end of that paper, why, up came a uh, man from the audience who said, I'm building a computer too. I'm interested in computers. It turned out this man from the Middle West, Dr. Ratanassoff from Iowa, uh, was indeed trying to build a computer. And uh, he told me he could do it very cheaply. That was interesting. And uh, come out to Iowa and he'd show it all to me. Well, I couldn't get out there until the following summer, which was the beginning of the 41 summer. And uh, when I did get out there, I found that uh, although he used vacuum tubes and he did do it relatively cheaply, why, uh, he lost the advantage of the vacuum tubes because he wasn't doing it fast. Uh, many years later, when they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of ENIAC down in uh, Washington, D.C., somebody brought up this thing about Adam Asoff. It, the, his name had been mentioned in a book, and the fact that Mockley had actually visited him back in 1940, uh, 41, I think it was. And uh, so I asked John about this, you know, what had happened there, and he said, well, the reason he never mentioned or talked about uh, Adam Asoff is it had absolutely no relation whatsoever to the ENIAC. He said he had been, John Mockley had been building parts of a computer long before, and by accident he had met this fellow who told him he was building an electronic computer. So when John went out to Iowa State to, and saw what this man was doing, what he was doing, uh, well, you can just compare this in, in time, if nothing else. What John was planning was to build a machine that operated 100,000 pulses per second. He visited a machine that operated one pulse per second. I mean, even if the man was using some electronic tubes in it, he was not using them for anything at all to get any speed out of them. He was just merely using them as switches and uh, the fact that it, you could only do one per second was slower than you could do it by hand. So John was not at all impressed. He thought that man himself was ingenious. It was a nice little idea, but it had nothing to do with electronic computers. <laughs> John and Press were the, I think, developers of the internally stored memory. I remember Press coming down to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was in my analyzer room and he came down from the ENIAC and they were already aware, aware of the need for more memory. And he said, uh, I got an idea, Joe, let me tell you. He said, you know how a kid goes to the store for his mother, bread, butter, meat, potatoes, bread, but he keeps saying it over and over to himself. He gets to the store and he says, bread, butter, meat, potatoes gets them and leaves the store and forgets all about what he went to get. Well, he said, I got an idea for a memory that will do that by repeating. Of course, he had the recirculating memory tank in mind, which he eventually developed and was in the Univac and the Binac before it, where you had tanks of mercury and you tweaked crystals at one end and they sent pulses down here. And the time it took to go through the mercury was the delay time and that's the length of the memory. Some people had no conception of what it took of how much engineering it took to build one of these things. And probably it would have taken quite a while if there hadn't been a press anchor.
The first time I ever met Press Eckert, he was here for a, we had this introduction to cognitive science in the in thing called the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science. Um, and we invented a, invited a bunch of Penn alumni. And a student was talking at lunch, an undergraduate, about some research he was doing. And, you know, he was just talking, and this white-haired uh, uh, fellow in the audience said, well, you know, I was talking about artificial intelligence. And he said, well, do you, are you interested in artificial intelligence software or hardware? And uh, this fellow said, uh, well, um, actually, I think both. I mean, you know, uh, not only do you need software, but, you know, well, the standard von Neumann architecture, well, and then all of a sudden this white-haired man cuts him off and says, von Neumann architecture, I invented that architecture, right? As this student sits there thinking, who is this man? Well, he didn't know, of course, it was Press Eckert. Dr. Goldstein actually claims, if you look at carefully, is that he contributed a certain logical clarity to the explanation of how you build a computer, and uh, that was the essence of what he was writing up, and the first thing which Goldstein had so carefully circulated widely, and that was the essence of what is in a later publication in 1948, I think it is, by Goldstein and Burks and Lemon. And so it's purely a misapprehension and misnomer on the part of many, many people uh, who have somewhere jumped to the conclusion that the stored program idea originated with von Neumann. This is, in fact, uh, known in science as the Matthew effect. Uh, there's an article in the uh, American uh, the AAAS journal, Science, uh, called something about the Matthew effect, about how many different discoveries and inventions and things were attributed to someone who had the biggest reputation at the time, but the person that really did it. Well, at any rate, up, the... Uh, up from the meadows rich with corn, clear in the cool September morn, the clustered spires of Frederickstad, green walled by the hills of Maryland. Uh, when they had the 25th anniversary of ENIAC, at, uh, at they, the celebration took place down in Washington, D.C. So we all went there, and while we were there, they said that the uh, Smithsonian had a great exhibit of the early computers, and they would take us by bus out to see it. So we went out to see it, and there we were looking at pieces of the ENIAC were set up so that it could operate, and uh, through some telephone connection or something like that. And while I'm looking at it, I see this plaque on it. It says, dedicated to the memory of John von Neumann. What in the world did John von Neumann have to do with ENIAC? ENIAC was built practically by the time John von Neumann ever even heard of it. And uh, so he sent for the curator and said to her, what is going on here? Why have they de developed, uh, devoted this to John von Neumann? And she said, uh, oh, that's a mistake, that's a mistake. And she went right away and got a screwdriver and took the plaque off the front of the machine. Now, this is a terrible mistake, and it just shows how all history cannot be believed, particularly history of computers. The computer that was developed at Iowa State University has often been called the ABC computer, and you can see uh, some components of it on display here. Most of it is gone, but we have a memory tube that was used from it. A reproduction of this has now been made by the people at Iowa State. Uh, the ABC computer was a special purpose machine designed to compute differential equations. And the thing that made it remarkable was that unlike earlier machines that used telephone relays, actual switches that would go on and off, uh, the ABC machine used electronic tubes to do processing. So it pointed the way towards later computers that would also use the fast speed of electronic tubes uh, for the processing component of the computer and also an electronic storage to go along with it. The proof of the pudding with Ananasov is that Sperry Rand actually paid to have a machine built, which by the way Ananasov had never built one. He had only proposed the ideas for one. He never built one. When they actually did build the machine, it didn't work. They built a model. It did not work. They couldn't get it to work, according to the way it was built. It wouldn't work. The original computer that he had, supposedly using vacuum tubes, it wouldn't work. It did one operation per second when it did work, 
by modifying it. But you see, they knew that he had modified it because his original books didn't have these circuits, and later it did. But the interesting thing from the point of view of at Nassau and me was that I tried to find out whether anything could come of his attempts at building a computer out at Iowa, and he didn't seem to want to talk about it. He wasn't interested in it as far as I could tell. And so I come to regard this, you know, in the same way that Ike Arbach uh, has in the remarks that he made about uh, Ed Nassau. He was a computer dropout. The problem was, the problem wasn't so much that these guys were wrong in what they were doing. They were perfectly right. As a matter of fact, they didn't patent, I would say, 95% of everything they did. They, they didn't even know to patent it. They didn't even start patenting it until very late in the game when it seemed like it might get important. And it was companies like Sperry, Gyro Company, or whatever it was, Sperry Company, who came along and said, my God, if these guys patent the computer, we're out. We're out. And so did IBM worry about it. And, and these guys are coming out with a computer to sell to Metropolitan Life Insurance. I think it was one of the first customers. And maybe John Hancock. I forget which two companies were doing that. But they gave them orders for original Univax. And these other companies are going, oh my God, if they patent this. And so the first thing they started to do was, how do we upset this? So they had tons of lawyers. I don't think Eckert Malkley had one lawyer that was any good. I think he was the guy that incorporated the company. I don't think he knew anything about patents. So I think what they, they just got caught. And then when they started to try to patent things, Sperry said, well, my God, let's find somebody who made even a knitting computer and let's claim that he got all his ideas from that. And we'll upset it. And you got to do is get a judge who doesn't understand any of this and who will agree that Dr. Markley did visit the guy in 1943 or whatever it was. Maybe he did get the idea. You know. And John Markley was so upset about the results of the trial. He was not well during the trial because he had a blood disease that re resulted in his having a massive nosebleed every day and uh, so when the trial was over John was just flabbergasted he couldn't believe that such a thing had happened and he was really unwilling to accept the judge's decision and he decided that what he would like to do would be to take the uh, patent and try buy the patent back from Univac and try himself to see if he could not sue and get his uh, patents back again. But uh, he, he was really devastated and he was never the same afterwards. Oh my gosh. <laughs> losing that case was a mortal blow to John Markley. I have no doubt about it. He said, they've told me I did not invent the ENIAC, that I got all my ideas from Adonisov, and so forth. He called me up on the phone during the last few months of his life, at least two, three times a week, at 10, 30 o'clock, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and we'd talk for two to sometimes three hours. Not just about that, but it was just generally his almost lack of further drive to do anything. He'd been really slain by that decision. And so he talked about many things. And one night I called him up, and I don't know what he asked me, but I said something. He says, well, you're a victim of the Matthew Principle too. I said, what do you mean by the Matthew Principle, John? 
What's the matter, Joe? Don't you read your Bible? Which was, of course, joshing from him particularly, and to me too, since I was an organist in the church. I said, what is the Matthew principle? Well, he says, it says in Matthew, to him that hath much, even more shall be given. But to him that hath little, even what he hath shall be taken away. And believe it or not, to me, that epitomized John's life from beginning to end. Well, I, I uh, became better and better known, apparently, at Ursinus for uh, uh, performing on a skateboard. Uh, it was often referred to as uh, roller skates, but it was actually a board with skate wheels on it, in which I was uh, putting this board on the top of a lecture desk, and then I stood on the board. Turning, turning the engines of the mind. 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 Yesterday as a 
Here you go there, Paul. I've got your little funny, what you call it, happy tape for you for your little movie. Your little documentary about the history of the boll weevil. Now you stay tuned, stay tuned for fine Mr. Mark. Mr. Mark. Mr. Mark. <laughs> What's really interesting to me is that uh, this machine is likely to be the way of the future, right? So that as we reach the end of what you can do with a single machine or a single instruction stream, um, what we're now looking at with uh, the Merced, right, um, is a new paradigm where what comes through is a computer that shows you its piece parts. And what each instruction word does, right, and this is very long instruction word computing, which is a hot idea in computing, which is only now beginning to be reduced to practice, is each word wires the whole machine together into some approximation of what's called a data flow machine, which is what this machine is. So I believe, actually, I mean, it's a crazy belief in a certain way, but I believe that, in fact, um, for the last 50 years, you know, we viewed this machine as an interesting, funny architecture, and then there's this standard architecture uh, that we've looked at. I think this machine's going to look a whole lot more like what machines are going to look like uh, continually in the future.